Hey everyone, I'm Mark Stevenson from the AVS lab at the University of Colorado Boulder, and today I'm going to be talking about using enhanced simulation environments to improve reinforcement learning for long duration satellite autonomy. I'd like to thank my co-authors, Lorenzo Montavani, Sean Phillips, and Dr. Hans-Peter Schaub, my advisor. So first off, we're going to be looking at the general idea of using reinforcement learning for spacecraft operations. Um, why is it promising? Where maybe does it not act how we want our spacecraft to act? And finally, some hypotheses on how we can overcome this undesirable behavior. So reinforcement learning is generally good at finding spacecraft operations policies. Um, and for some RL vocabulary of policies, just a mapping from states to actions, um, really just what action should I take in response to my certain um, current situation. Um, this policy in the case of deep reinforcement learning is going to be re represented by a neural network. Um, and reinforcement learning is able to produce high reward closed loop solutions to difficult tasking problems while being very cheap to evaluate on board. Um, the closed loop aspect comes from the fact that we're just continually reevaluating our policy every time we make a new decision, um, which means that we are acting with response to the current environment as opposed to just executing open loops and sequence of tasks like many uh, um, pre-planning approaches uh, do. And the cheap to evaluate on board aspect is that these networks take milliseconds to evaluate, which is really cheaper than even a, you know, um, pretty much any sort of optimization process you could think of. Uh, and you can see previous work out of the AVS lab um, for, for more background on this. Really, the requirements that we're looking for um, in, in spacecraft operations, especially, especially with reinforcement learning, are we want to be performant, which is uh, just maximizing a mission objective, and we know that reinforcement learning is good at this. We need to be robust, which means it needs to perform well under you know deviations from expectations. And because RL is essentially closed loop, um, it will be good to this up to a certain point, but the fact that it uses neural networks to represent um, you know, its, its policy means that it's, it has some limitations to how well it generalizes. Uh, we need these policies to be safe and avoid failures, and other work from the lab has shown that using shielded reinforcement learning can provably um, guarantee safety. And finally, uh, this needs to work for uh, long durations. Uh, all of these need to be maintained over the course of an entire mission. The two main aspects that we're going to be looking at in this work is how to increase the robustness of these policies, as well as applying these policies on long durations, you know, weeks, months, years, decades even. So one thing to think about is that human operators and a reinforcement learning agent are going to approach this, the, the tasking problem very different ways. A human operator is really probably going to prioritize long-term survival above everything else. Um, and in doing so, they're anticipating all the different possible failures or sorts of degradation they could encounter. And as such, they're inherently conservative or even pessimistic about how the spacecraft is going to operate, which is a good thing in this case. Um, we, we don't want to lose our multi-million dollar vehicle. The reinforcement learning agent, on the other hand, um, does not have anxiety about losing its job or losing millions of dollars of hardware. Um, it, it just sets out to solve the exact problem it's given. So um, since you're going to be opt you're going to be training it on finite episodes and probably over like a, a reasonable range of conditions, it's going to be optimizing over those uh, situations, which means that it's only going to anticipate failures and faults that are um, built into the simulator and encountered by the agent while um, exploring the environment. Uh, likewise, a, a human operator knows how a spacecraft works. They have intuition about the system. They know what sorts of faults can be can be triggered um, and how they uh, will come about. And they're going to operate in a way that intuitively uh, minimizes these things. Um, reinforcement learning also is going to minimize, try and minimize the faults that encounters, but it can only learn about these faults by interacting with the um, simulated environment. Um, and if these faults are rare enough, um, it, it may never find them, even if they are modeled and intuitive to a human. Um, if a safety interaction is only encountered once during the entirety of training, it's probably not going to learn 
that it should avoid um, reaching that state because just not enough training data to, uh, to, to learn that. So how can we fix this? Our hypothesis is that we can modify the environment to encounter these dangerous states and safety interactions more frequently. And as a result, uh, end up with better performance that's more in line with human designed operations. So there are three things we're going to try. We're going to try using longer episodes, um, which is going to allow the policy to learn or the, the agent to learn long-term consequences of the policy at the expense of fewer episodes, which means we're learning with fewer different initial conditions. We're going to look at a wider initialization for each episode. Um, so in that, this case, that means that um, we're going to initialize the satellite in some very unsafe states, like going into eclipse with 1% battery, things that we know are going to lead to failure. But we don't care if we're failing during training. It's, it's going to be a good thing if we fail during training so we can learn about that domain. So um, by increasing that initialization domain, we're going to increase the, the domain of states that the satellite is quickly learning about and quickly learning that it should avoid reaching. Finally, we're going to look into using augmented parameters. So in this case, this means we're going to be training on a worse than worst case scenario, um, like a highly degraded spacecraft, more challenging space environment. Um, and that's really just to induce some amount of pessimism to the agent in the way that uh, humans might be pessimistic about the way that a, uh, a satellite could operate is a way of just being more cautious, more careful. Um, yeah. So next, we're going to look at our example mission scenario that we're applying these uh, ideas to. It's going to be a simple data scan scanning science environment with some um, resource management. Uh, and then we're going to look at some modifications uh, that we're specifically going to apply to try and improve training in this environment. So the nadir scanning environment uh, has the objective of maximizing data collected from being in a ground pointing nadir scanning mode. Uh, we download, we need to downlink this data when we're over a ground station. And over the course of the mission, we must maintain positive battery levels. We need to prevent our reaction wheels from saturating by occasionally desaturating them. And finally, we can't take new images of the buffers full, so we need to downlink um, data as we uh, reach ground stations. This last one really isn't a hard constraint. Failing or filling your buffer is not going to lead to mission failure, but it is going to prevent you from succeeding more by collecting more data. So the uh, to formalize this as a partially observable Markov decision process, um, we can establish our action space, which we have our charging action our downlink action, our reaction wheel desaturation action, and our uh, scanning data collection action. Um, we have our observation space, which includes uh, you know, relevant quantities all normalized, such as our reaction wheel speed fraction, our, um, the level of our battery, our pointing direction, um, our, our data buffer level, as well as information about upcoming ground station opportunities and upcoming eclipse transitions. And this uh, overall framework is something we've used in previous work of this high level action task based um, uh, planning. And that's because we're able to, you know, provably create stable controllers to do all these tasks. This is something we've been doing for decades now. And instead of having the um, reinforcement learning agent have to learn how to point our solar panels at the sun or how to scan downward, we can just have it make those high level decisions while using these um, handcrafted lower level controllers to actually execute the tasks. Next, we have a reward function. So we get reward for at each step for the amount that we've increased the data buffer at that step. And this is normalized such that the maximum cumulative reward for an episode is one. Uh, we give the satellite a negative penalty if it reaches a failure state. And finally, anything else, no harm, no foul, uh, you're just not getting any reward. So finally, our transition function we get by just propagating our high fidelity spacecraft simulation, which we'll talk about on the next slide. And then we have our termination conditions. So we have our failure states, which along with which terminate the episode along with giving that negative reward. And that occurs when we saturate our reaction wheels or drain our battery. And then finally, our, we also will terminate the episode without a penalty if we operate for some period without failing. In this case, um, 
kind of taking three episodes as our short training duration and 15 as our long duration. So this environment um, we've implemented using BSKRL, which is a spacecraft simulation um, environment for reinforcement learning that we've developed. We start with standard gymnasium API for reinforcement learning. We then build a spacecraft simulation environment using Basilisk, which is a fast and flexible spacecraft simulation framework that the AVS lab develops. Um, this uses a C++ backend, Python frontend, so both easy to work with, but also, you know, hundreds to a thousand time um, simulation speeds, which is obviously really helpful for uh, this sort of work. And that gives us BSKRL, which is a way of easily customizing environments for satellite reinforcement learning um, research. We have a QR code there if you're interested in checking out the repository. Um, this inherits the best of Basilisk and Gymnasium. We get our modularity, we get high fidelity, um, and it's compatible with all of our major uh, reinforcement learning libraries. Open source, so you can download it and play around with these environments yourself. And the main focus right now is Earth observing flight mode tasking, though it definitely is extendable to other areas of interest. So looking at our training environment, um, how are we going to apply those, apply those enhancements that we previously mentioned to this particular environment? Uh, I believe I already mentioned we're using longer episodes, so we're going to compare training over short three episode, three orbit episodes to longer 15 orbit episodes. Um, we're going to look at a wider initialization of various parameters. So we're going to look at initializing to a wider range of battery levels that includes nearly no charge, a wider range of data buffer levels, and a wider range of reaction wheel speeds. So really, we're putting the satellite potentially in some very undesirable situations and even unrecoverable situations at the start of episodes. We're also looking at augmenting the satellite's parameters. So that's going to be things like uh, limiting the data buffer size, limiting the battery capacity, and increasing external torque. So each of those things kind of uh, impacts one of the main aspects of this, um, either two resource constraints and our science objective. Finally, do these modifications um, actually help performance when, when we train with these various enhancements? And uh, because I'm presenting here, I think you can say, safely assume yes, but let's see how uh, how well they increase our training or our performance. So first, our hypothesis is really based on the idea that more safety interactions and training is going to be better for the final policies. And do we actually see that? Well, we trained each um, combination of enhancements, so eight different policies total from no enhancements to all three enhancements and every combination in between. We trained those each for 5 million steps, and we see that the enhancements greatly increase the number of safety interactions that we get. Um, without any of those enhancements, we're seeing you know, a 0.05% chance per step during training of failing, whereas uh, with all the enhancements, we're getting up to the half a percent, one percent chance per step in training of encountering a failure. And yes, failures are bad when you're deploying the satellite, but in training, they aren't a bad thing. This just means that we're learning even more about those safety critical um, regions that we that we really do want to know about to create good policies. Uh, to actually evaluate these policies, we're going to deploy them for a long time in the nominal environment. So in this case, a long time is one week um, or 105 orbits roughly. Uh, and we're going to, and the only difference between this environment and the standard training environment, the nominal training environment, is just the episode length. So they're very, very similar as far as the MDP goes. Um, and we're also going to compare these against a basic um, hand design policy and just a random policy that uniformly selects between the actions. So looking at the um, reward accumulation rate, so this is how much, how, how much of the time is it spending in our um, imaging mode. We see that our augmented um, parameters especially really increase that record, reward accumulation rate, um, as do the other uh, factors such as longer episodes and wider initialization. Um, and we do see more operator-like um, uh, behaviors induced with these enhancements, such as higher battery levels um, over time, which even though that's not inherently necessary for 
uh, to you know solve this environment if we have some unexpected unmodeled thing that affects our battery level um, you're, 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 you'd rather have a higher battery level than a lower battery level. The same thing goes for data buffer. Um, these enhancements maintain a lower data buffer level than the, uh, than the unenhanced environments, which is good because, you know, if you suddenly have something exciting happen or something bad happen to your flight computer, you'd rather have that extra space. Finally, even though failures can be handled with, um, the use of a shield, a policy that inherently is avoiding these failures is more desirable. Um, it, it means that it's really optimizing, you know, for the for the problem at hand and not going to be relying on a shield while just doing something else. And in this case, we see that these enhancements greatly decrease both types of failures. So these enhancements have a big imp performance improvement on the nominal environment, which is somewhat surprising um, because really the main goals of these enhancements were to increase robustness and make sure that it, it works better in a, in a long duration or works as good in a long duration, but it actually just increases performance across the board, which is unexpected, but good. Next, we also talked about um, the robustness issue. Can our policies continue to work even if our spacecraft is performing in an unexpected way? Um, so to test this, we deploy over that same week-long period, but on a satellite that is degraded. So we have a smaller battery capacity, smaller solar panel efficiency, I mean, things that will degrade over time on a spacecraft. Um, and we again see that, well, while the differences in reward accumulation aren't as great, our enhancements still generally do create policies that are better at accumulating reward on this unexpectedly bad satellite. Uh, the battery level is likewise still held higher. The buffer levels are still held lower. And most excitingly, um, we see that th this robustness comes into play with the amount of failures we see. These enhancements almost nearly or even totally eliminate the uh, failures that we're seeing in, the, um, in this degraded environment, whereas the standard policies do a lot worse um, in terms of failures because it's, it's just not an environment there. Um, familiar with. And sure, because they are closed loop, we do see relatively decent performance in some cases, like they, they aren't failing, you know, like the short narrow standard fails only 10% of the time, not amazing, not terrible, but that's coming at the expense of reward accumulation. So this, the, the idea that these RL policies is closed loop helps, but the enhancements are really what is both keeping reward high and keeping uh, failures low. So in conclusion, these enhancements to the training environment work. They allow us to maintain performance in a degraded environment, and they even improve performance um, when we're deploying for a long time in a nominal environment. Uh, there are some limitations, of course. Uh, one of the main questions that we need to answer better is how much should these environment parameters be augmented? Um, we, we show in the paper that too much augmentation can hurt performance eventually just because you're creating a way, way too conservative policy. Um, but we also showed in this, the, the, the slides, that certain uh, augmentations can help performance. So there's clearly a sweet spot there or, or better things ways we can handle these augmentations to really um, maximize how much they're helping performance. So for the future work, then, um, the question is, how much do we enhance these environments in various ways? What what is necessary to get better performance. Um, I think there's the potential to develop like custom training routines for uh, you know, actively changing these, uh, the amount of enhancement, um, perhaps using different training and evaluation environments, uh, but obviously beyond the scope of what we've done yet. The other, I think, very interesting question is we saw here, we uh, augmented the parameters and induced a particular and induced some more desirable behavior like higher about or higher battery levels, lower buffer levels, things like that. But is there a way to go in reverse um, where we can induce operator pre preference using these sorts of um, enhancements or uh, you know added challenges of the training environment? And uh, this is kind of an alternative to the idea of like reward function shaping. Um, that is, can be likewise used to induce certain preferences. Uh, anyway, thank you for listening um, to this talk and please check out 
our other presentations from SciTech.